Uh, welcome to those of you that have just joined us now. Um, really great time, and we're going to start our Q&A time with Professor Lennox. I just want to say thank you again, uh, Professor Lennox, uh, for being with us today. I really appreciate your talk. I uh, especially loved your point about how the God of the Bible creating the universe and belief in him actually drove science. It's great that this has been as thought-provoking for all of you here today as well. There's been a lot of questions that have come in, and we're going to try to get to all of them. The way we're actually going to run this is Professor Lennox now has the iPad with the questions that have come in, and he will read them out and then answer them in turn. So I'll pass it over to you. Well, thank you very much for all these questions. This is a Q&A, so it's going to be very inadequate, <laughs> because most of them looking at them now would demand another lecture. You're not going to get it. But that's a good thing because Q&A time is an opportunity for me to survey your questions, relate them to one another, and suggest to you ideas that would occur to me in this kind of situation for pursuing them. Because the most interesting thing about the questions you've asked will be your attempt to get more information about them. If you seriously meant these questions that have come in, you'll not be content with my answer. You'll go away and do some research, and you'll make the answer your own. And that's a very important thing. So uh, I like Q&As simply because they're going to provoke you to do a lot of work after you leave this room. So I'm going to pick them. Um, representative questions are enough to keep us here till midnight tomorrow, at least. So I'm going to just pick some of them. So don't be disappointed if your question isn't, isn't dealt with. I have a website called johnlennox.org, and you can look up many debates, discussions, and so on, where many of the questions will have come up. And secondly, if you look at veritas.org, veritas.org, you will find 20 or so lectures that I've given in major universities throughout the world on all kinds of topics. Or some of them are debates, some of them are moderated discussions, some of them are lectures. All of them have massive Q&As. So you might want to follow that up at veritas.org. So let's have a look at this. When considering the infinite nature of the universe, isn't any numerical probability nullified? As anything that is possible to occur must definitely occur. The answer to that is no. And uh, the reason is this, that the very interesting developments in recent years on looking at the universe, the word infinite is the problem here. What do we mean by infinite? In pure mathematics, of course, you could have various infinities, but the question of whether there's an infinite number of actual things is a very dubious proposition. But we don't even need to bother with it because there are three famous uh, cosmologists, uh, Alexander Vilenkin, Alan, Alan Guth, and a man called Bord. And they have published a fascinating mathematical result which has the implication that whether you believe in multiverses, universes, or whatever, there is a finite backwards bound in time for universe stroke, stroke multiverse. You do not have an infinite amount of time. So probabilities are not nullified. That's the first thing. The second thing is you've got to be very careful with probabilities. I mean, look at you all. The probability that you exist is almost zero, isn't it? Yet you do exist. I hope you believe you exist. And the question about you and me is not the antecedent probability. How probable is it that John Lennox existed if you were calculating that in 5000 BC? The question is, is John Lennox actual and is there evidence for it? We don't decide the issue of God and probabilities any more than we decide your existence and probabilities. We decide it on evidence for actuality. And there's a great deal of confusion in this area that could be cleared up at a stroke. Now, probabilities are important, but they need to be kept within their bounds. And it is the very low probability of having life, say, carbon-based life in this universe, that has um, driven people to suggest that there is many universes, any universe that can exist must exist, and so on. So we ought to be 
to be surprised to find ourselves in a universe like this one, because after all, it's the only kind of universe that we can find ourselves in. And that relates to another question uh, about the uh, anthropic principle. Uh, <clears throat> doesn't the anthropic principle um, <clears throat> show that uh, God is not necessary? And the answer to that is no. The anthropic principle is not a solution to anything. It's the problem. You see, the idea that we could only exist in this kind of universe because the only kind we could exist in doesn't explain why there is a universe like this. It's, it's almost a tautology, as many philosophers have recognized. Secondly, increasing the number of universes doesn't improve the probability situation. I had a very good friend, an atheist, who was a world-class philosopher of physics who believed in the multiverse. And he said, look, any idea that the multiverse increases the probabilities is false because it commits what's called the reversed gambler's fallacy. And if you don't know what that is, uh, look it up on the internet and you'll discover that. So there are profound intellectual difficulties in going along that line. The other problem with multiverse explanations is we have by definition no access to these other universes. So the evidence that they exist just isn't there. And some wit has put it, he says, look, the choice is simple, either one God or an infinite number of universes which are not accessible, in which everything that is possible to happen can happen. So there's a universe, apparently, in which there's a copy of you enjoying the sun in the Bahamas right now. And somebody said, well, that's a bit curious. Are we to believe that there is a universe in which Richard Dawkins has just been crowned Pope? And Billy Graham has just been voted atheist of the year, you see. It, it becomes a bit ludicrous, actually. And that's why many leading scientists reject, like John Polkinghorne, the idea of the multiverse. Now, to be fair, not all do. I know Christians, very bright Christians, like Don Page, co-worker of Stephen Hawking. And I wrote to him about this because I've written a book on this topic, if you want to follow it a little bit. It's called God and Stephen Hawking, whose design is it anyway? And I, I, I deal with what is being said about the multiverses. But Don Page is a professor, a very distinguished physicist in Canada. And he said, look, the idea of the multiverse doesn't rule out God at all. God is perfectly capable of creating as many universes as he likes. Now, do you hold your own faith to be falsifiable by prospective scientific discoveries? Well, the Christian faith makes historical claims, so of course it's falsifiable. Central to my faith is the historical belief that Jesus Christ literally rose from the dead. The Greek word for resurrection is anastasis, which means standing up again. It's a physical concept. And so, you see, it's falsifiable. If you could prove that he didn't rise from the dead, that's the end of Christianity. That's one of the things, actually, that attracts me to the Christian faith is that it's not a mere philosophy. If you're bright enough, and even sometimes if you're not, you can invent a philosophy. But you can't invent history. And Christianity is geared into history. So certainly, yes, um, Christianity is falsifiable. It's falsifiable at the experiential level as well. Christ makes a claim. Let me just take one claim. He claims that if I trust him as Savior and Lord, he can transform my life. He can turn drugs into a happy family. He can prevent divorces happening. He can bring peace into an abusive situation. I've seen that happen hundreds of times. Now, if that didn't happen, if he makes the claim that if you trust him and that didn't happen, it would falsify Christianity. So there are all sorts of ways of falsifying Christianity at the experiential level. So one of the reasons, turning that upside down, one of the reasons that confirms my faith in God is seeing and having experienced now for a lifetime the reality that Christ does what he claims to do. That's phenomenal evidence. Just en passant, and I don't mean to be flippant with this, I don't see atheism doing these things. 
But that's up to the atheists to challenge. Now, a couple more questions here. Um, why do you think atheists still do not acknowledge God even though scientific evidence clearly points to a creator? Well, of course, I believe it does point to a creator. But I don't think that believing in God is a purely intellectual exercise. Because it's belief not in a theory. God isn't a theory, he's a person. And when it comes to trusting a person, other very big issues come into play. Now, it wouldn't be fair of me to second-guess atheists. I'd prefer to read what they say. Thomas Nagel, who's a brilliant philosopher in America, says, I don't, I'm an atheist, but I don't want there to be a God. That's very honest. Julian Huxley once said, what a wonderful discovery it was that there is no God so that I don't have to answer for my moral behavior or lack of it. There are moral issues that come into, into this and each one of us has to answer why it is we don't believe. And very often it comes down to that because Christianity makes real demands. The central Christian claim is, as Jesus said, I am Lord. And that means that if I'm going to enjoy this life he promises, I have to repent. That is, I have to say no to the, the muck that has been fouling up my life. And I have to control my, my fingers on the internet mouse button before I get dragged into some world that destroys me. God will promise his help, but we have to make those decisions. And so there's a whole spectrum of things that stop people believing in God. I have a little test that an Irish farmer taught me a long time ago. If a person can't see reason, reason isn't their problem. It's a very simple test to apply. If a person can't see reason, reason isn't their problem. So that's how I would respond to that. Now, <clears throat> often discussions about God and science degrade to arguments about Christians who believe a literal seven-day creation versus evolution. This can be a major stumbling block. What are your thoughts on this? Many is the answer to that. And I've written another book. And forgive me, but I get asked these questions so frequently, I find the best way to deal with it is to write books about it and get people discussing them. So that helps me to explain to you that my book, God's Undertaker, Science Buried God, is about this question. The seven-day creation question, I've just written a new book about it called Seven Days That Divide the World to point out that we needn't get upset over this. One of the problems, ladies and gentlemen, in this area is that we don't take the Bible seriously enough. Let me illustrate that with one point, and if you want to pursue the others, have a look at my book, or go to Socrates in the City on the web, and there you'll see a lecture I gave in New York on the topic of the seven days of Genesis. But I'll just illustrate it, if I may, but with one point. And that is, you will see sometimes Christians fighting about the age of the earth. Is the earth young? Uh, at which point the scientific world laughs them out of court, but the Bible says it's young. But the Bible doesn't say it's young. The Bible is so careful to say, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Those first two statements in Genesis are in a different past tense than the description of the six days so-called of creation, which Hebrew scholars tell me means that the first statement in the Bible is detached from the sequence of days. Here's the irony of it. No matter what you believe about the days, they say nothing about the age of the earth whatsoever. The Bible says nothing about the age of the earth at all. It simply says, in an indefinite time in the past, in the beginning. Now, the whole discussion misses the substantive point, which is that there was a beginning. Because, you see, for centuries, Aristotle dominated the intellectual field in Europe. He didn't believe in a beginning to the universe. And in the 1960s, and I remember it, because I was there, I was your age in the 60s as a student in Cambridge, the first evidence began to come in that the space-time was not backwards infinite in time. There had been a start. Now, here's the thing that you may not know. 
That idea, which is commonplace now and is a central notion, the standard model in physics, was resisted with ferocity in Britain by the scientific establishment. And Nature's the most famous scientific periodical in the world, and it ran an editorial which said, we must not go down the line of accepting there, were, there is a beginning to space-time because it will give too much leverage to people who believe the Bible. Isn't that stunning? One of the biggest scientific advances of the 20th century was resisted because it seemed to support the Bible, which of course it does. And I pointed out to the people that discovered the Higgs boson at CERN not long ago who were asking the question, do I really mean to say that this ancient document could have anything remotely interesting to say to us in the 21st century? I said, well, here's the thing for a start. The Bible has been saying there was a beginning for millennia, not just for centuries. And perhaps they said with a little smile, if you'd taken it more seriously, you might have looked for evidence for a beginning earlier than you did. But you didn't, you see? So you can base a prediction on scripture. Just as, of course, and I bring this in at the side, if you study scripture, you could base uh, 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 the whole fact that science is worth doing because many of you may not be aware it's the Bible that commands people to do biology. The very first intellectual activity, according to Genesis, was go and name the animals. That's taxonomy. It's the fundamental intellectual discipline in every subject you'll ever study. You're learning new words, as the medics know to their pain when they have to name every bone in the body. Yes, taxonomy. God is pro-science, he's not anti-science, you see? So, that brings me to the next question. Now, let's have a look at this. What are the main positives and negatives of discussing evolution as part of a theology science dialogue? Well, you have to discuss it because people are going to bring it up as they've done here. So that's the first thing. But behind the question is a very legitimized um, notion, I think, that we've got to separate two things that they get awfully confused. The first is, is Dawkins right, for instance, when he says that you can deduce atheism from evolutionary theory? That's the first thing. The second thing, does evolutionary theory bear the weight that's put on it? Now, generally speaking, the heat is generated by confusing those two questions. The first question is a question about worldviews. Can you deduce atheism from biology? The answer is clearly no. They don't even belong to the same category. And there are many people who believe in God and accept various levels of evolutionary theory. I mean, the idea of natural selection and mutation in itself is innocuous because just look around this room. You can see that we don't all look the same mercifully. Selection has something to do with it. I mean, even in a group like this, sometimes selecting is going on. <laughs> you see? Let's be realistic, ladies and gentlemen. And all of us have mutations, a third of us have mutations that will probably kill us in the end. So it does something. That's not controversial in the slightest. Darwin observed it. The big question comes, of course, when you claim that it's a creative thing that produces information. I doubt that as a mathematician, but I've written about that and I need to go into it. The important thing is that the existence of God doesn't depend on your attitude to a biological theorem. That's the important thing to settle. Otherwise, you'd be very confused in the debate. Now, there's much more to say, but as I say again, God's Undertaker was written about that. Now, um, let's see how we are getting on. Okay, let's have a look. Now, there's a whole raft of questions. One, two, three, four, five, six. So we better handle that. Six questions, utterly legitimate questions. Well, the first one summarizes it. A man who's brave enough to put his name on, Charles. Thank you, Charles. 
Do you think the Creator is the Christian God? Why? Well, you see, what Charles is thinking quite correctly is that what I said to you in my lecture, which was on science and the God question, can science find the fingerprints of God, was strictly about that. I gave a lecture on the topic I was asked to give. And what five or six of you and perhaps many others have noticed is that it's a leap from believing in God to believing that God is the God of the Bible. You can understand that, of course. My argument could lead you to believe, as many do, in some kind of an intelligence behind the universe, whatever. But I'm a Christian, and so you're asking me the question, why do you take the step from that to the Christian God? Now, this is not on the topic, but since you asked it, I feel that I ought to be polite and try and answer it, okay? So, I'll try to answer this, but it's a very important question. You see, why am I a Christian and not, say, a Buddhist or a Muslim or something else? The only way I know how to settle questions like that is on the basis of evidence. But because this is a sensitive topic, the moment you raise other religions, people get very nervous about tolerance and all this kind of thing. So I need to explain something before I even start answering the question, and that is this. From where I sit as a Christian, every one of you, whatever you believe, is of infinite value. You're made in the image of God as a moral being. Now, what does that mean in practice? It means that my atheist friends could put me to shame morally. That's what it means. So anything I now say is not said as a deconstruction or criticism of people's morality. Absolutely not. Now, once you've cleared that up, we can have a respectful discussion of the matter. So let me illustrate it. Take, well, take the three major monotheistic religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. They all believe in God. They all refer back to Abraham. But they differ. And... I find no difficulty in discussing this with my friends from those two religions. They differ, for instance, on Jesus Christ. My Jewish friends, of whom I have many, believe that Jesus died, he did not rise. My Muslim friends, of whom I have many, believe he didn't die. I believe he died and rose. A little elementary primary school logic will show that those three things cannot be simultaneously true. So how do you decide it? I only know of one way. Now these, this is a historical claim he rose from the dead. Now we can't repeat it in the laboratory and see what happened. Just like Inspector Morse. Have you heard of Inspector Morse in Australia? Wonderful, isn't he? They're just filming him. Lewis in my college at the moment, and there are dead bodies lying all over the place. I tripped over one of them the other day as I bumped into Inspector Lewis and had a little chat with him. Well, now, suppose Morse is investigating a case and the, the body has usually been murdered by some professor or other. You know, we academics have an awful reputation in those, in those films. But Morse doesn't say, okay, chaps, let's rerun the murder and see what happened. That's nonsense. You can't repeat it. So what you do is apply not science in the inductive sense. You see, we're often taught at school that all science is repeated experimentation. It isn't. That's inductive science. But there's another vast wadge of science which we call abductive science or inference to the best explanation where you look at an event that is unrepeatable and you say, right, how can we explain this? Well, if A happened, then B would happen and then that would have happened. So there's an explanation. Somebody else says, oh no, if X happened, then Y would have happened and that would have happened. So we ask, which is the best explanation? And one of the reasons I'm sitting here as a Christian is that the resurrection of Jesus is the only explanation that makes sense to me of the historical facts. And I've written about that in my book, Gunning for God, the two final chapters. And the final one is on why I believe 
the resurrection actually happened as a fact of history. So that colors everything. The second thing is, it's not simply historical evidence. It's experimental evidence. I come to the fact, to the situation objectively, where I believe that there's strong evidence supporting Christ's claim to be God incarnate. But then I can test that, as I said to you earlier, so I needn't repeat it. He makes certain claims and certain promises. If we trust him, he'll transform our lives. I've done that and it's happened. And I've seen it happen thousands of times since. So I've built up what you might call cumulative evidence to show that um, I can stake my life, so to speak, on it. So that is the reason. But the final reason in this area is this. Contrary to popular impression, Christ doesn't compete with any other religion because he offers me something none of them do. My friends tell me that their religions, all of them, are basically tell you that there's a path. There may be an initiation right to get on the path. You try to stay on the path, which has usually got moral rules to follow. You have gurus or priests or imams or, or folks to guide you and help you. But it's a bit like Adelaide University. You got an entrance exam, I presume, you're in, you're on the way. You've got very nice professors here, I haven't the slightest doubt. But have you noticed they can't guarantee that you'll get through finals? Have you noticed that yet? No matter how nice they are and how kind they are, they cannot tell you you're going to get a degree. They hope you'll get a degree. But they can't tell you you're going to get a degree. Because there's the final exam, there's a big judgment coming for some of you this year. Okay? That's the way many people think of religion. That it's a merit procedure. There's some judgment at the end that if God accepts what we've done, if it's good enough, we'll get through into heaven, nirvana, or whatever it is. Christianity says nothing like that whatsoever. Although many people think it does. Christianity tells you that it's not based on merit. That God diagnoses us absolutely straight and says, old chap, your merit will never succeed because God is utterly holy. So God has made a way to accept you that's not based on your merit. And this is where the death and resurrection of Christ are central. The claim is, and it's good to hear it before you reject it, the claim is that Christ took all that stuff that mucks up our lives all that mess, the Bible calls it sin, all that rebellion, he's taken it on himself and he's died for you and me. So if we trust him, he accepts us right now. That's fantastic. You see, I'm not trying to give lectures about God in order to please God and say, what a good boy have I. Will you accept me? Not at all. I'm doing this because I'm accepted. No other religion offers me that, so they're not, Christ isn't in competition with them. He's the only one that offers me that. So that's something you've got to factor in. Now, that's a big topic, and I've just got time for one question, I think, to finish. Now, let's go to another section of questions. Um, let's see. There are some things about the world that make God look either absent or not good. Why does your God allow bad things to happen such as tsunamis? Now that is a very seriously important question. And it is also a difficult question. It's related to another question which has been asked, which is if God is omniscient, then how can free will exist? He would know every action we will ever take, good and bad. If that's the case, then is morality meaningless? Well, if that's the case, morality is meaningless, but it's not the case. You see, our problem is that with the relationship of God to time, we get this naive idea that God's sitting up there and he's limited to time as we are, so that if he knows everything, then he causes everything. That's not true. 
trivial example, you're in a helicopter above the Empire State Building and you're looking down, you see two streets converging. You see two cars from your helicopter, one going along this street, one going along that street at 50 miles an hour. You can see they're going to crash, but your knowledge doesn't cause them to crash because you're in a third dimension above the two spatial dimensions in which the cars are operating. So naive ideas of God's relationship to time will eliminate free will. But those naive ideas, I believe, are false. And the magnificent thing, and again, one of the things that convinces me that Christianity is true, is that God has created within us the capacity to say yes or no freely, which means that we can love You see, if you weren't able to choose, there'd be no such thing as love. A robot can't love. Who who would like to be married to a a robot? Or if a robot is a girlfriend, is a boyfriend? Press the button marked kiss, and you you get a robotic kiss? That's meaningless, you see, because it's pre-programmed. Now, once you've got a universe like that, if people are free to say yes to each other, they're free to say no. Now, this problem of tsunamis is known technically as the problem of pain, the problem of natural evil. It's related, but not the same as, the problem of moral evil, the bad things people do to one another, as we are tragically seeing on our news headlines every hour of the day. So how do I deal with them? Well, let me honestly tell you, This is the hardest question I face. I have many colleagues and friends who say, okay, there may be an intelligence out there, a God of some kind, but please don't talk to me about a personal God who cares. I understand that. I have a brother who was nearly bombed to death by terrorists in Ireland. I have a sister who not long ago lost her 22-year-old daughter to a brain tumor. And I arrived in Christchurch two days after the earthquake. And every lecture I gave, every interview I did on radio and television, you can see them all, Google my name and earthquake or New Zealand, they put them all on one web page. I had to meet people who'd lost their husbands because the tectonic plates of the earth moved. Tsunamis, tectonic plates, pain, cancer, all those things that don't have anything obvious to do with other people's interference. Natural evil. What do I do about it? Well, suppose I become an atheist because of it. As many people do. And I say, you're perfectly entitled to respond like that, and I can understand it. But please notice you think you've solved the problem. And in a sense, what you're saying is, well, let me quote Richard Dawkins on this. The universe is exactly as we would expect it to be. If at the bottom, there's no good, there's no evil. There's no justice. DNA just is and we dance to its music. Well, you notice that exit all morality if there's no good and no evil. So he has no right, if he believes that, to talk about the problem of evil because he has dismissed evil. So my first point is this. There are two ways of looking at this problem. The one is the observer, the other is the participant. Cancer looks very different to a professor of oncology and to a young woman of 20 who's just been told she's three months to live. And we need to approach this question with enormous sympathy because it has an intellectual side, but it has a very deep emotional, personal, and pastoral side. So I'm going to try to be sensitive because in a crowd like this, there are people hurting, desperately hurting. I know that. So let me approach it very briefly as we draw this thing to a stop. If you take the atheist route, that's just the way the world is. Tectonic plates shift, etc., etc. There is no God. And there is suffering. Some people have a good time, most people have a rotten time. That's just the way it is, it's a brute fact. Well, you, I mean, you can, you're entitled to that view, but please notice that you 
haven't removed the suffering. It's still there. Please notice number two that you have removed all hope. Because for you, there is no life after death. There is no God who's fair and who will judge and sort it out ultimately. So you have no hope. Absolutely none. That's not a very happy solution. And uh, once talking to Richard Dawkins, I said, Richard, your view is terribly bleak. He says, yes, it is. I know it's bleak, but that doesn't prove it's false. But I said, it doesn't prove it's true either. So how do I approach this? Well, I observed something a little bit strange. Tsunamis, earthquakes. Let's think about earthquakes for a moment. Do you know if earthquakes didn't happen, none of you would be alive? If you studied geology, you will discover that earthquakes, that is the shifting of the tectonic plates, are essential for establishing the balance of carbon and oxygen and so on. So that poses a massive problem, doesn't it? Here's something that appears to be essential to life, and it kills people. Now, of course, it kills people because they build houses and fault lines. If they weren't there, they wouldn't be killed. So here we have an irony, you see. And it raises the deep philosophical question that you've never had an answer to. Surely a good and all-powerful benevolent God could, might, would. And you go round and round and round. Haven't you students done that to the midnight hour? Wouldn't a good God have done this, made us so that we couldn't, and etc., etc.? Well, my brief answer to that is God could, of course have made you so that you couldn't kill anybody else. He could have made you a robot, but then you wouldn't have been human. You can wish yourself out of existence if you like. So God's got a problem in creating you. Just as I had a problem in creating my children. Holding the little girl, born, realizing that she could grow up to say no to me. Why have children then? Well, you know why because it's worth it. You see, God has a similar problem to us. I'll come back to that in a moment. This business of pain and suffering, whether it's caused by other people or tsunamis, etc., etc. We can philosophize about it till the cows come home, as we say in Ireland. And we don't get anywhere. So I ask a different question, and it's this. When we look at life, we see that it is beauty and it is barbed wire. Look at Christ Church Cathedral or Coventry Cathedral. Coventry Cathedral bombed, damaged in the war, moral evil, like Dresden Cathedral. You see the traces of a former beauty, but you see a bomb has hit it. Christ Church Cathedral, you can see traces of its former beauty, but you know an earthquake has hit it. It's a mixed picture. Your life's a mixed picture. The beauty of the mountains and the hills around Adelaide, spectacular. But there are people in terminal cancer in the hospital. There are some of your relatives that don't know what to do and are in despair. It's a mixed picture. It's beauty and barbed wire. Now, since it's like that, here's the real question, I think. Is there anywhere evidence that there's a God you could trust with it? And I believe there is, ladies and gentlemen. The central symbol in Christianity is a cross, but it's a symbol of a reality. And to cut a long story short, one of the most powerful things. You see, the claim is, it's a huge claim, and you'd be crazy to believe it if it wasn't true, is that Jesus was God incarnate, God coded in human flesh. People say that's scientifically impossible. Nonsense. God who created the universe and created it with his regularities, he's not a prisoner of his laws. He can feed a new event in as he wills. And if you don't follow that argument and are interested in it, again, the second last chapter of my book, Gunning for God, deals with David Hume and his objections to miracles. The claim is that Jesus is God incarnate. So we're faced with this huge question. What's God doing on a cross, to put it bluntly? Do you know what it tells me at the very least? 
It tells me that God has not remained distant from human suffering, but has himself become part of it. Secondly, the resurrection. What does that mean? Well, Paul preached to the philosophers of the ancient world that what it meant was that God had appointed Jesus as a judge in the last day. I think it's a wonderful thing that there's going to be a judgment. Richard Dawkins says there's no justice. So the terrorists get away with it in the end. Hitler gets away with it in the end. He uses power, he gasses six million Jews and dear knows how many uh, Poles and, uh, and people who are mentally ill and so on. And then he blows his brains out and he gets away with it. Do you believe that? Of course not. This is a moral universe. And if our sense of justice is not to prove an illusion, there must be a final assessment. And that's what the resurrection of Jesus Christ guarantees. God has appointed a man through whom he will judge the world. In righteousness, it will be perfectly fair. So, two things. One, I have a massive problem with evil. But I think I say, see a way into a solution. I've come to believe God can be trusted with it. Because God hasn't remained distant from it, one. And two, he's going to judge it utterly fairly. And when we see that, our questions will stop. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you once again, Professor Lennox, for being with us today. As a uh, small uh, token of appreciation, evangelical students would like to give you this gift. Oh, thank you very much indeed. <laughs> of South Australian wine. Let's oh, show our appreciation yeah. once more. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you to you our audience, for being here with us today. On your way out, remember to leave your response forms with the ushers at the door. Thank you for your time.